Welcome back, everybody, to Corey Hughes' Bloody History. Today we're going to continue with uh, Harold Weisberg's Carrie Thorne, the Archive. We have an interesting letter here. <laughs> this is, we're going to read some more words of Carrie Thornley himself. I love this guy. Um, this, from what I've gathered, just from reading the first couple lines, is that uh, he uh, supplied the uh, Atlanta Police Department with some information, I'm assuming, on Harold Weisberg. And uh, this is a letter written by Carrie Thornley. I don't know who it's written to, but we'll figure that out as we go. Um, but, you know, Carrie Thornley likes to run off at the mouth, and so there's always little tidbits of information that we can glean from his uh, uh, verbal diarrhea, which is what we have here. <laughs> so fucking funny. Um, so this is about eight pages long of this fine print, so who knows how long this will take, but I think this is all we're going to cover today. <clears throat> Um, so theoretical context for statements delivered to the Atlanta Police Department and distributed widely to other organizations and individuals in July of 1975. Recently, I am supplied some information to the Atlanta Police Department concerning a man, I am now 99% certain, has been operating for 12 years as a sort of entrepreneur of political assassinations. On the basis of my personal discussions with this individual in the early 60s, and on the basis of all the material I have read concerning the John F. Kennedy murder in particular, since then it appears to me that the individual I have named engineered a fatal alliance between all of the political enemies of John F. Kennedy. He could find who were in positions of government power under Kennedy, who commanded positions of wealth and influence in the private economy, or who could be relied upon to carry out the actual dirty work of the murder itself. Specifically, I think this individual obtained the cooperation of uh, one or more individuals within the CIA hierarchy who hated JFK because of the Bay of Pigs disaster and thereby obtained the unwitting cooperation of everyone who was under the orders of this individual or these individuals. Also, I think the man I have named made friends with and obtained the assistance of some persons of that bureaucracy, either that or he struck up such an alliance with the man who was Secretary of the Navy under Kennedy and thereby obtained the unwitting cooperation of numerous employees of the Office of Naval Intelligence. This man, I have reason to believe, had also been cultivating for some time previous to the assassination the trust and friendship of the well-known Louisiana underworld figure Carlos Marcello, who already had numerous CIA connections uh, springing from various anti-Castro activities in which the mob and CIA had collaborated, as is now well established, in the early 60s. Either directly or indirectly, the man I have named to the Atlanta police also must have obtained the cooperation of at least the FBI, one, of, one FBI official in Dallas, uh, an agent by the name of Hosty, who was deeply involved, according to solid evidence, in setting up Lee Harvey Oswald as a fall guy for the assassination. All right, so let me pause. So, um, it doesn't seem as co though Kerry Thornley is talking about um, Harold Weisberg. I kind of took that from, he says, the entrepreneur of political assassinations, meaning um, uh, that Harold Weisberg was some kind of like political assassination vulture, right? Like he was making money off all these assassinations and that's what he was doing. But no, it appears as though this letter, um, he's uh, indicating that this person is connected to the assassination. So, <clears throat> let me continue Either directly or indirectly, the man I have named to the Atlanta police also must have obtained the cooperation of at least one FBI official in Dallas, an agent by the name of Hosty, who was deeply involved, according to solid evidence, in setting up Lee Harvey Oswald as a fall guy for the assassination. Finally, I believe my enterprising acquaintance went to numerous wealthy individuals in this nation who regarded Kennedy as a serious problem and offered to exterminate the president in return for a considerable amount of cash. For the most part, I think this was a blind alliance wherein very few of those who participated in the murder conspiracy were wittingly involved and wherein few, if any, besides the central organizer, whom I have designated, knew or wanted to know who else was sponsoring or executing the project. After the event in Dallas took place, trails of evidence seemed to lead in every possible direction because of the large number of individuals who were unwittingly involved. Moreover, numerous powerful and wealthy people had very good motivation for seeing to it that the truth was covered up, <clears throat> since they had themselves provided the man who organized the Kennedy murder with cooperation and or money variously in each individual case. 
I feel quite safe in speculating that later on this same individual who masterminded and organized the JFK murder used exactly the same kind of techniques, adapting them to fit the circumstances to assassinate both Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. The reason I gave information based on my personal interaction with this man to the Atlanta police was because Commissioner, it uh, looks like Eves, was then uh, investigating the Martin Luther King assassination. His investigation resulted from the allegations of one Robert Byron Watson. In the area of these allegations concerning conspiracy to murder King, Watson seemed, in my mind, to be talking about the man I have, I suspect of having organized the JFK assassination. Gary Kirsten, or Kirstein, or Kirsten, some similar spelling, <clears throat> is the name I knew him by. I was introduced to him by Slim Brooks, a well-known French quarterite in New Orleans. Slim generally referred to Gary as his brother-in-law. I met Slim in 1961 and became acquainted with Gary later that same year, probably in the spring or summer. Sometime during the initial phase of the period of time that I knew Gary, he purchased some land in Kenner, Louisiana, and built a house on it. Gary was in his late 30s or in his 40s. He was balding and had some unusually large forehead. Uh, five o'clock shadowy, clean-shaven face, protruding lower lip that may have gotten that way from his constant pipe smoking. <clears throat> he was not tall, had a pot belly, and tended toward the thin side. Uh, his voice, uh, while quite masculine, was sometimes or was somewhat on the high-pitched side at times, especially when he let out with a brief giggle at one of his own jokes. He rather had a capricious sense of humor, which often centered around his own arbitrary prejudices. He spoke at a normal pace, but his words were somewhat clipped, for the lack of a better way to describe it. He used to say that he came from a German family in the Midwest, and that he was a Nazi and always had been. This, he frequently alleged, was why the government had put him and other Germanic Midwesterners in the Pacific Theater during the war. Uh, he may have told me that he was in intelligence in the service, but that is an extremely vague recollection, and I forget whether he was in the Army or the Navy. He generally wore short-sleeved blue or white shirts and dark slacks. I think his small plot of land and the house he built on it were on the Jefferson Davis Highway. For a long period of time, while I knew him, he worked at the Anheuser-Busch Brewery not too far from where he lived. I do not recall ever having spent any time with Gary, uh, which was not also in the company of Slim, Roderick R. Brooks. Um, <clears throat> I recall re uh, receiving he, Slim, and Ola Holcomb as visitors in the apartment on St. Louis. Mrs. George Landlady, next to the Napoleon House Bar, where Greg Hill and I lived in the spring and summer of 61. One time, a day or so after one of these visits, possibly the only one, Greg's typewriter vanished, and I always suspected Gary, who made jokes occasionally about being a burglar and a fence for stolen goods. Uh, this was a Hermes, I think Italian, model upon which I was typing uh, the first draft of The Idle Warriors, my forever unpublished novel based on Lee Harvey Oswald's defection to the USSR. I would have been working at the Foster Awning Company at the as a part-time telephone solicitor when this happened, uh, which was where I met Slim. We reported the incident to the police, and they came by and told us from now on not to leave or lock or, or leave our doors unlocked. Another visit with Gary took place when Jessica Luck, Slim, and Gary and I went out to look at the property Gary had purchased in Kenner. <clears throat> I can't place when this was, but it was possibly autumn of 61. I recall Gary warning us about copperhead snakes and telling us they actually chased people as we stamped around in the underbrush. It was on this occasion or another one I seem to recall driving out in the woods for a picnic, the same four of us, but this is vague, when the car we were in was a black or dark limousine. Later during the week, Slim told me, and I think later repeated to Jessica, I've got a surprise for you. That was Carlos Marcelo's car you were riding in last weekend. I was also told or had read in the papers that Marcelo was in Guatemala at the time. <clears throat> the next time I recall visiting at any length with Gary was after his house was... After his house was the land on Kenner was built, I seem to recall it was Slim's idea that we go out and spend some time with brother-in-law. It is not clear in my <laughs> it is not clear in my mind whether 
There was one, two, or three such occasions, but I recall sitting there near the door across from the room with Gary and Slim on the sidelines discussing the following. One, how might go about assassinating John F. Kennedy? I recall proposing the use of a remote control rocket, for example, a sort of homemade missile to bomb the White House. As far as I was concerned, this was a strictly a bullshit rap. All Gary and I had in common was our political enemies. He didn't like Ayn Rand because she was a woman. And he even said during one of these discussions, don't talk to me about that raving red in reference to Barry Goldwater. Uh, the discussion wandered on at an easygoing pace for a long while, possibly all afternoon. Finally, at one point during this discussion or these discussions, Gary said words to this effect. I think the best way to pull off a political assassination and get away with it would to have a whole lot of people working on it, but kept under the illusion they were working on other things so that afterwards, even those who participated in, in it wouldn't know it. Don't you think that would be a good way to do it, Gary? I agreed. In other words, before using me, he even obtained my moral sanction. Hmm, interesting. He next observed that in order to do this, he would have to control a very large bureaucracy, which, as far as I was concerned, established that the whole discussion was purely ap academic. Two, uh, people Gary didn't like. Gary was soft-spoken and light-humored about his admiration for Hitler and other Nazi leaders, and without expressing any particular hatred in his voice, used to say frequently that he did not like Jews, blacks, gypsies, etc. He also absolutely had no empathy for jailbirds, which was the exact quaint expression he used. I do not recall vividly, but he may have even suggested setting up a jailbird to take the blame for the assassination. The use of that word in the Watson testimony in Atlanta papers certainly did ring a bell with me. Immediately, Gary popped into my mind. Three, Lee Harvey Oswald. During the period of time I met Slim and Gary was when I was working the hardest on the first final draft of The Idle Warriors, my novel based on Oswald's defection to Russia. Then and thereafter, I frequently brought up the themes and characters of the Idol Warriors, and I know we discussed Oswald, but certainly never in relation to setting him up for an assassination. Four, Hitler and the German High Command. Uh, Gary had some interesting ideas about Hitler, which he was prone to introducing into conversations as often as I was prone to introducing the subject of my novel. In particular, he believed that the secret to Hitler's power had been that he was the least powerful and least ferocious of all the Nazi leaders. He had no independent base of power, no direct official control over any bureaucracy or branch of the armed forces or police, so he was able to function as a middleman, a compromised candidate that all the others trusted more than any of them trusted one another. He said he was going to write a book on the subject with the working title of Hitler was a good guy, and its prime focus was going to be on what a bunch of utterly... Uh, ruthless ideas the other Nazi leaders had. He introduced, uh, he induced me, and I think possibly even paid me some small amount to do research for him on this book, which, as he portrayed it, would not advance Nazi ideas, which I was sure he was serious about anyhow, but which would convey this notion of power politics. I'm positive I read at least one book on the subject, made notes, and turned them over to Gary, after which he, uh, the project seems to peter out. <clears throat> on this um, fourth page here, we have at the very top, it says, uh, third statement on Gary Kirsten. So this is the first time we actually have a reference to what this heading is. The discussions or discussion mentioned in my 25 July 1975 statement about Gary Kirsten probably took place in 1962, but I'm not sure. Another subject Gary uh, briefly discussed significantly Enough was New Orleans D.A. Jim Garrison. At the time of this discussion, I admired Garrison and we argued. Gary seemed to have a cheerful dislike for Garrison, which, as with most of his dislikes, didn't even pretend to have much of a rational basis. As an Ayn Rand type, I was uh, very much against any kind of irrationality, real or projected in those days. Uh, he finally said that the main reason he did not like Garrison was that he wears a vest. He said also that he uh, told this to a man at the brewery where he worked, who was a Garrison supporter, and that the man had thought it was uh, very funny. Sometimes it was difficult to tell when Gary was joking. This conversation took place during the same time period uh, that the other others at his home took place, I think. Finally, Gary quit working at Bush. 
He said there was one guy in particular he did not like there, and that when he decided to quit, he walked up behind the fellow and kicked him in the back of the head and then went and turned in his resignation. The way he described it, it sounded physically impossible. I don't remember uh, when it was that Gary made this next remark to me, but I'm pretty sure we were in the French Quarter, perhaps at Slim's or walking the streets nearby. He said he liked having a house which was out in the country because there were no neighbors around to hear screaming. He said this with a delighted evil smile. I'm sh I sure as hell hoped he was joking, but really didn't want to find out. That remark really freaked me out, so I think it must have occurred sometime after the other discussions already mentioned because I wasn't feeling especially freaked out about Gary when Slim and I were out there at the house. Gary enjoyed cultivating an image of himself as an evil antisocial person, a burglar, a Nazi, and in that one incidence, possibly a sadist. Slim also used to joke about how evil Gary was, but except for the one scary moment mentioned in this paragraph, I just interpreted it as a lot of silly talk. I think I made some effort to acquaint Gary with Carlos Castillo, a friend of mine who owned a Mexican restaurant in the quarter and who had uh, traditionalist rightist political views. But I think Gary said he didn't like Carlos because Carlos was a Mexican. I'm not sure about this. It's very vague. Slim and Gary and I probably went to Castillo's for a meal once or something like that. And I probably told them that they should get to know one another. I don't seem to have any other memories about Gary during the period from 1961 to 1963, except one. Jessica was late on her period one month and thought she was pregnant. Slim said Gary knew where she could get some abortion pills without a prescription. So Slim and Gary and I got together somehow, but Gary did not get to the point, and this puzzled me. He seemed to be toying with my dependence on him. We spent a long time together and finally drove to a remote spot out in the country where after we got out of the car, he walked over to a spot under a tree. Gary told me the name of a drugstore where I could buy these pills from a dishonest druggist who also sold uh, paragoric to little kids. I don't know what that is. I decided against the pills because Gary went into great detail about how they worked poisoning the woman's system so as to cause it to reject the fetus, and it sounded very dangerous. <clears throat> I couldn't understand why Gary took me all out this way to the boondocks to tell me this, but didn't ask. Just assumed it was very paranoid about the subject. Instead of getting the pills, I got some Hershey's M&M-style candies, put them in a uh, Katz and Best Off credit envelope, and took a couple of white ones out and told Jessica to take them according to an arbitrary schedule, hoping the placebo effect would cause her to menstruate, <laughs> since I suspected the whole affair might be psychological anyhow. This worked. Afterwards, I told Jessica what I had done. She was amused. This happened during the period I was living on Napoleon Avenue, and I think it was summer. I don't know whether it took place before or after other discussions. The next time I saw Gary was around autumn of 64 after I had testified before the Warren Commission and when I got uh, and when I was on my way from Arlington, Virginia, where as garrison charge I had lived for a year after the assassination to the Freedom School in Colorado. I stopped over for a few days as I recall. One of the things I learned was that Ola Holcomb had shot herself in the head and killed herself with as I recall a 38 revolver a couple of weeks earlier. When I asked about the motive, someone told me she was upset over some man she was in love with. I also remember hearing that Ola's mother, with whom she was living in the quarter, had discovered the body. Ola and I had been very, very close for a while in 1961. She was my first convert to Ayn Rand in the French Quarter. She was a very strong person and also very considerate of others and seemed to have great love for her mother who moved down from Mississippi to live with her later on. I was shocked and surprised in the summer of 1961, I'm pretty sure, when Ola and Gary began going together. I believe they lived together for a while. This stimulates two other memories of Gary. He was a painter, though not professionally, and had a ground floor apartment in 1961 in the quarter with one of his paintings of a stripper on display. If he and Ola lived together, it was here. I also recall Gary mentioning a couple of times that an art critic once complained about one of Hitler's paintings, that it was possible to count the stones in the cobblestone street, so concrete was the style. Gary asked me if I didn't think that was unfair of the critic. 
During my 1964 visit, I persuaded the manager of the Quorum Coffee House on Esplanade to allow me to give a lecture there one evening on behalf of the intellectually respectable right, which was to say they're the more libertarian of Goldwater supporters. Slim and Gary were both there. Gary was in his usual good spirits and did not seem at all upset over Ola's recent death. I most vividly recall him sitting out on the patio behind the coffee house after the lecture was over. Slim and I were standing there, and whenever anyone and I didn't know walked by, Slim would introduce me to them, saying, This is Kerry. He knew Oswald. This somewhat embarrassed me the two or three times that it happened, so each time I said, Yeah, I masterminded the Kennedy assassination. How do you do? And shook hands. At this time, there was little doubt in my mind that Oswald had acted alone. So it seemed like a harmless, if tasteless, joke. Well, Gary just sat there in the shadows looking at me and smiling the most incredibly smug smile unimaginable. He said very little that night, if anything besides the customary greetings. But he just kept looking at me and smiling, and stupid ass that I am, it never even crossed my mind that he might have had anything whatsoever to do with JFK's murder. Even in light of our previously mentioned discussions on the subject, the thought never crossed my mind. It never occurred to me that he might have the power to do such a thing. Slim was the first person that I became acquainted with upon arriving in New Orleans in 1961. Later, I will put together a more complete statement on him. But for now, I just want to say that I met him at the Foster Awning Company shortly after going to work there as a telephone solicitor. Greg Hill, who went to New Orleans with me, brought home a friend from his first uh, job named Ray Allen, and since Greg got work before I did, I met Ray before meeting Slim. But in the beginning, Slim was more my friend, and Ray was more Greg's friend. Slim really took me under his wing and showed me around the French Quarter. Now, when I went to New Orleans in 1968 in answer to Garrison's subpoena, Slim was again the first person I encountered. I was walking the streets of the Quarter looking for familiar faces, and Slim crossed at a corner up ahead of me so that I could not possibly miss him. I yelled out to him and we joined company and walked along the street together. He said to me at one point during our conversation, look, you don't plan to mention brother-in-law to Jim Garrison, do you? Since Gary uh, still did not seem at all relevant to anything that was happening, and since I certainly wasn't into stirring up Garrison's paranoia about me any further by bringing up each and every time I had bullshitted about assassinating JFK with someone, I assured Slim that I didn't plan on mentioning Gary, but also wondered why he should ask. Slim said something to the effect of, because for a while times were really hard and brother-in-law and I went out and did some midnight shopping, uh, butch the burglar style, and one time we got caught. But later on, somebody did us a favor by stealing our police records from the files before the case got to court. So if you mention Gary Garrison, that might provoke some unwelcome memories and some questions like what happened to the records. Ooh, interesting. Once again, all I knew for sure about Gary now was that he was a petty burglar and that for one weekend he had somehow managed to borrow Carlos Marcelo's car. I still did not know much about Marcelo and had not read near enough about the assassination to know that Marcelo's name keeps popping up again and again in relation to it. Finally, I had no idea until after I testified before Garrison's grand jury that Marcello and the CIA had been working together in anti-Castro activities in Louisiana just previous to the John Kennedy killing. So I didn't mention Gary to Jim Garrison, but would have if I had been questioned about something related to him. I did mention Slim, however, because Garrison was very interested in the period immediately following my arrival in New Orleans in February of 61, the day after Mardi Gras. Garrison fired all kinds of names at me for identification, some of them over and over, but Gary Kirsten's was not among them. I did not become really suspicious of Gary until 1973 when the Watergate revelations began making it clear that there is some kind of alliance between the mafia, the CIA, big business in the South, and military-industrial complex. Even then, he was only one of many suspects in mind as I tried to figure out why there were so many coincidences linking me to the JFK assassination, and how and by whom I had been framed, as I was sure I was, in New Orleans in 1968. 
hilarious. The appearance of the so-called mystery tramp photos in the uh, Yipster Times last summer and an article called Cowboys vs. Yankees in The Great Speckled Bird, which conceptualized the above, described the alliance as a southern rim of the ruling class. Focus my suspicion more on Gary, but I still had some alternative theories which I couldn't disregard. Moreover, there being no official investigation, there was nothing I could do about my suspicion but harbor them. I believe it was on October 16th of 1974 that Joe Cooper, an ex-cop investigating the JFK assassination in Louisiana, was murdered in a suicide setup similar to Ola's alleged suicide. He had been committed to a theory that the Office of Naval Intelligence was deeply involved in the assassination and apparently considerable evidence linking Naval Intelligence personnel to the assassination. Moreover, at the time of his death, he had been poking around in the involvement of a prominent Louisiana underworld figure in the assassination. The article on this matter did not say, but I assume the underworld figure in question was Carlos Marcello. I have also suspected the Office of Naval Intelligence of having something to do with the assassination for reasons which pertain in part to my subversive attitude during the last year I was active duty in the Marine Corps, Oswald's real or posed Marxism, and Fred Korth's position as Secretary of the Navy under JFK, Korth being a Texan who was very close to Lyndon Johnson. There were other possible theories of my unwitting involvement, which did not include Gary, however, and I was hard put to separate the irrelevant from the relevant, the paranoia from the persecution. During the past several months, I have been sure that I was very close to figuring it out. And I have also been very fearful that the CIA or someone would find out just how far I had narrowed down my list of suspects and theories. Some months ago, I all but buttonholed uh, Reber Bolt and got him to listen to my raving and ramblings for three or four hours. Among other matters, uh, which still may or may not be relevant, I mentioned the most pertinent aspects of my dealings with Gary Kirsten, the quote assassination talk, and his alleged connections with Marcello. Last week, Reber asked me if I had been following the Watson case in the papers, which I had not, although I had learned some things about it, all of which were very general, from Mike Rothauf. He then told me that Watson uh, was mentioning some of the same people connected with Marcello that I was, or that Watson was also mentioning people connected with Marcello, I forget which. Anyhow, I checked the papers soon after and read about the man unidentified who boasted that he would kill Martin Luther King just as he had killed John F. Kennedy and set up some jailbird to take the rap. That had to be Gary, it seems to me. Jailbird is one of his special words. Hang on a second, hang on a second. I got some marbles rattling around upstairs here. Last week, Reber asked me if I had been following the Watson case. I'm not familiar with the Watson case. I'll have to dig into it. and next By next show, I'll have some information on, your, on that for you. But uh, the Watson case, which I had not, although I had learned some things about it, which were very general from Mike Raufauf. R-A-U-F-A-U-F. Mm-hmm. So then he told me that Watson was mentioning some of the same people connected with Marcello that I was, or that Watson was also mentioning people connected with Marcello. I forget which. Anyhow, I connected, or I'm sorry, anyhow, I checked the paper soon after and read about the man, unidentified, who boasted that he would kill Martin Luther King just as he had killed John F. Kennedy and set up some jailbird to take the rap. Interesting. I don't know who he's talking about there. But that has some significance. That had to be Gary, and it seems to me jailbird is one of his special words. Shortly after my discussions with Reber, of some months ago, perhaps he will recall the exact date, I furiously scribbled out brief commentaries on all the people I suspected as having been involved in my life and also in the JFK murder, and stashed them where they would be found eventually in case of my death. I gave this material to Reber last week with a few last-minute notes appended. Finally, last Saturday, there was that unearthly event at the Celestial Mansion, described elsewhere, during which I was asked if Kenner, Louisiana meant anything to me. There is now precious little doubt in my mind that Gary was wittingly and centrally involved in the JFK assassination, and that he is the man Watson is talking about who used the word, quote, jailbird. 
I'm willing to take any sort of lie detector examination regarding these statements. I'm also eager to expand on them when answering any questions anyone may have about points which seem obscure. Hmm. That's pretty interesting stuff. It's pretty interesting stuff. So this is what I'm gathering. This is what I'm gathering. So we'll see a building, right? So we have uh, Kerry Thorny's involvement in the assassination and leading up to it from 61 when he gets back in, according to him, March of 61. But I think he was back in February because I'm starting to become convinced that it was Kerry Thornley at Bolton Ford with Lawrence Howard. Okay. So then you have that in January of 61. He says he gets back in February, whatever. Um, but from there you have the assassination in 63. So you have that, that's one era of Kerry Thornley's life that he references here, right? The, you have the Marine Corps era, both pre and post Oswald. Then you have this New Orleans era starting according to him in March of 61 through the assassination. Then after that, he goes up to Arlington, Virginia, Right. And then he does whatever he does after that and goes wherever he goes after that. Ends up in California where he becomes a doorman at the same building that Johnny Roselli happens to live in. And according to him and his confession, remember, he he talks to Garrison about how uh, he had long conversations with Johnny Roselli. Right. So it's fucking hilarious. Right. He puts himself he builds this story around him. Right. And he, and he builds up all this stuff. And then I think what happened is like I think he started to get scared. I think he started to get scared. I think he realized he talked too much. So now he's talking for real, right? That's what I think is going on here. Or at least possibly. Not saying 100%. I think it's it's one possible future, right? <clears throat> but um yeah, interesting stuff and this is in July of 75. July of 75. Um I'm sure the Discordian stuff was already going on at this point, but I'll look into that. But uh, that's going to be it for today. I just wanted to get this episode out and uh, go through this uh, letter because anytime we have writings of Carrie Thornley, they're definitely, definitely worth reading. So that's going to be all for today. And uh, I will check back in with you guys tomorrow. And I uh, hope you all had a Merry Christmas and all that good stuff. Uh, if you have not yet, um, please pick up a copy of my book. It is available on Amazon.com, A Warning from History. And... Um, if you go to buymeacoffee.com slash JFK book, uh, you can make a donation. You can make a monthly recurring donation. You can pick up, um, what else can you get there? You can get my notes, right? My 650 pages of notes you can pick up there. You can also get um, my limited edition art prints, which I think I have 90 of them left. Uh, so, yeah, uh, all those things will help me out. But uh, if you haven't picked up the book, definitely get the book from somewhere. God, you can get the ebook for only 10 bucks. And, uh, that's about it. So, all right, guys, uh, that's going to be it for today. And I will be back tomorrow with more continuing along through Harold Weisberg's Carrie Thornley archive. See you, everybody. <laughs>